Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. In Seminole County in Florida. In the fall, my next door neighbor and myself were walking down a dirt road in Castleberry. The road runs alongside of a wooded tract of land. The land has been reserved for a bird sanctuary. Anyway, this road runs behind some homes all the way down to South Seminole Middle School. On this evening, we were walking to the school for a dance in the gym. It was about 9 p.m. We were about 50 or 60 yards from the end of the road where a large opening sits. I had briefly stopped to tie my shoe. Suddenly, we heard crashing sounds, like footsteps, only louder. There were five or six steps, and as we turned to look at what was making the noise, two trees parted, as if giant hands were just brushing them aside. Sadly, we were both too scared to stay around any longer. We ran all the way around SSMS and around the elementary school and cut through the catwalk and ran the rest of the way home. Several weeks later, my mother reported hearing loud noises outside of our house. We owned one of the homes that sat next to the woods. She said that she had been woken by our pit bull staring into the woods and barking. She said she had heard these large sounds almost like footsteps, except she said that they covered far too much ground. She said she had heard four or five steps and the sound of wood breaking, and then a large thrashing sound as though it were shaking large bushes together. The next day, my mother, myself, and our neighbors went out into the woods to investigate. We found a large branch, approximately 10 inches around, that had been torn from a tree. And I do mean torn. This wasn't a cut or a branch that had been struck by lightning. This had been ripped from a tree. Anyway, we lived there for several more years, and although my friends and I spent a whole lot of our summer days and nights searching those woods for some kind of proof, none was ever found by us. I've been wondering for a long time if anyone in that area has experienced the same thing. Of course, this kind of started a rash of sightings in this area. However, this was not our intent. In fact, we only told our closest friends, and since some of them ridiculed us, we just tried to put it behind us. In fact, until now, I'd only repeated this to my wife and kids. It was at nighttime. It was very dark, and I never actually saw it. But something definitely parted the trees about 10 to 12 feet above the ground. This area is thickly wooded. It was a large bird sanctuary. Although these woods are thick, there are a lot of marshes in them. On to the next one. In Taylor County in Florida, during November, December deer hunting season, my stepfather took us hunting many times in the Snipe Island grade Econfina River area. His family had owned many acres of land in that area for years. We spent quite a bit of time in the area camping out, sleeping in makeshift lean-tos. Numerous times while being left alone, I can remember the eerie sensation like I were being watched and the hair standing up on the back of my neck. One evening, it all came to a climax. After a day of hunting, discussing how astounded we were as to how quiet it had been and how still the game was. There was no sound of cricket or nothing, not even a bird making a noise. There was one noise we did hear occasionally, which sounded like a hoot owl on steroids. We did discuss a very distinct odor, which smelled like a skunk or worse. My stepfather said it was just a wild hog or so he thought, and we made nothing of it. 
Hours later, I remember being awakened by my stepfather sitting up and screaming at something to go away. He quickly fired several shots off a rifle up into the air. The same stench at this time was terrible and gut-wrenching. We could all hear a loud crashing noise as whatever it was ran off into the woods. As we sat up and were talking, he described a tall, looming figure which had walked up and was looming over the lean-to. He guessed it as at least seven feet tall. There was a loud, hoot-owl-like noise several times during the night. All over, animals had been quiet that day and not even any insects making a noise. For several weeks prior, and even afterwards, my stepfather and his friend had been hunting quite extensively. He often commented on the eerie silence, how nothing, even bugs, seldom, if ever, made a noise. The days we were camping out, we all experienced hair standing upon our necks, and we felt like we were being watched. Also, about a week earlier, my stepfather and a friend had shot a young buck. Again, he marveled at how quiet the forest was. He marked the area, the deer had fallen, and went after his friend to help him retrieve it. Nowhere, when they returned, could they find the deer. A few months later, they were in the area and found the deer in an entirely different area. He recognized the skull as the deer had a unique set of horns. He knew because he watched the deer fall and knew where it should have been. The witnesses were all family members who were asleep under a makeshift lean-to. It was the middle of the night, between 12 and 4 a.m. The area is swampy terrain, a mixture of cabbage palm trees, hardwood, and pine, within walking and hiking distance of the Gulf of Mexico. On to the next one. In Santa Rosa County in Florida, it was on the main road that turned off into Whiting Field and had the huge power lines running through it. I was only a kid and haven't lived there since I was 14. While deer hunting in Milton, Florida, I saw a large reddish-brown unknown animal run on its hind legs through a cleared power line area 10 miles north of Whiting Field Naval Air Station. The distance was about 100 yards. I then departed the area and never returned. It was just a large animal running on its hind legs and able to clear about 125 yards in under 10 seconds. A month afterward, two stories appeared in the local newspaper. The sighting was between 7.30 a.m. and 8 a.m. in partly cloudy light mist. The area is heavy pine and hilly. There it was heavy brush in the field and lots of gullies in the area. And heavy with vines on the field. The top of the hill, however, looked like a farming area, and I would say the hill was 200 yards high. On to the next one. I grew up on a farm in southern Pennsylvania. My immediate family, including grandparents, aunts, and uncles, all lived adjacent to each other on this land. If you totaled all the land together, it came to overlook 100 acres, most of it wooded. The wooded parts were thick, with old hardwood like oak, maple, and various pines. Large streams and creeks cut through the land, which eventually spilled into a river close by. The land had abundant wildlife, like white-tailed deer, squirrel, fox, and the occasional wild turkey. Growing up, I spent many days hunting, mainly squirrel or deer. In fact, in my high school days, I'd often return home during squirrel season, which stretched from September through December, and get my rifle, either a Winchester Model 94 chambered for 22 caliber or a Ruger 77-22 bolt action rifle. Both had nice scopes on them and were highly effective for taking the little tree rats. I would go out by myself sometimes, but also hunted with my cousin who lived close by. 
One afternoon in October, I went out alone. I was 16 at the time and needed to stretch my leg and think. The woods and hunting was a good place for that. As I hiked along, my mind was somewhere else. Being 16, I now had girls on the brain, and my thoughts were plagued by typical teenage drama. When I finally snapped out of my daze, I noticed I was in a part of the woods I'd never been to. I was surrounded by old growth trees. Their trunks were easily four to five feet in diameter. The terrain around me had shifted from fairly flat to rolling hills that dove deep and narrow. I found myself standing atop these hills, looking down into the bottom of a hollow where a large grove of laurel sat thick and tall. I slowly made my way down and suddenly was overcome with a heavy feeling of dread and the uncomfortable sensation that I was being watched. This feeling was so heavy, I froze and began to look around, expecting to see another person, but didn't. This fear kept growing to the point that I felt truly scared, like nothing I'd ever felt before. It was such an odd sensation, my head spun around. I looked left, then right, but saw nothing. However, I couldn't get this feeling to stop. Suddenly, I saw movement in the laurel, followed by the distinct sound of footfalls and branches snapping. I called out to whoever or whatever was in the laurel that I wasn't alone, hoping that would give whoever it was pause. It worked. The footfall stopped, but my fear was still amplified. My hands gripped the Ruger 77-22 tightly and out of an abundance of caution because of the fear that was racing through me, I raised the rifle and leveled it at the laurel. I again called out. I wanted to make clear to whoever was there that I wasn't alone, nor would I be trifled with. This was when things got terrifyingly weird, as I got a response from the laurel in the way of chattering. That's the best way to describe it. Over the years, I've wondered if it could be defined differently, but I can't. It legitimately sounded like something was chattering. I raised my rifle just above the laurel, and out of fear, I squeezed off around, hoping I'd strike fear in whatever was there. All I can say now is that it didn't work. In fact, the opposite happened. As all hell broke loose, the chattering became a distinct growl, followed by crashing. I could see the top of the bushes moving and it was clearly coming towards me. I again called out that I wasn't alone by saying the names of my cousins. It didn't work. It kept crashing through the laurel and coming towards me. I didn't hesitate. I cycled the bolt of my rifle, chambered another twenty two caliber round, and fired. This time, I didn't shoot over the laurel, but into it. I'm sure the hunters out there listening to this are cursing at me, as I had violated every basic firearm and hunting rule. Yes, I had fired at something I couldn't identify, but all I can say in my defense was I was 16 at the time, filled with pure terror, and literally felt like this was a life-or-death scenario. If you could have heard this thing, I challenge anyone with a rifle not to fire. My second shot didn't phase it. Whatever it was kept coming. Not willing to take a stand, I turned and ran up the slope. Now, I should mention that it was dusk and light was going fast, and by how far I'd gone, I wouldn't get back to my house until after dark. When I crested the top of the hill, I looked back and saw something hairy come out of the laurel and look up at me. The distance between me and it was about 75 to 100 yards, if I recall. As I write this, I'm getting chills up my spine because I can still see it looking at me. Out of pure instinct, I cycled the bolt on the rifle and fired at it without even aiming through my scope. A 10 by 40 Tasco. I have to assume that I missed because it didn't respond or flinch. All it did was fully emerge and stand. 
I took a few seconds to look at it before turning on a dime and racing away. What I saw wasn't big, maybe about five to six feet in height, and it was covered in long black hair. Its arms were long, and its shoulders were broad. I couldn't make out its face or too much detail as I was a distance away, like I said, and the light was dimming. As I sprinted, I kept tripping and falling. I knew the direction I needed to go, but I also knew I was a ways out. I had gotten a good 10 or 15 minutes to travel. My heart was pumping, and all I could think was that I needed to get home or I might die out here. I suddenly heard heavy footfalls crashing behind me. This only intensified my desire to get home. I ran through low-hanging branches, cutting my face and hands as I went. I tried to jump over fallen trees, only to trip, my rifle taking a beating. The footfalls soon changed direction and were now parallel to me. It had caught up but didn't run me down. Instead, it was pacing me to my right. I didn't know what to think. I just knew I needed to get out of the woods and home. I thank God that I was a runner at the time because I don't know if I could have kept the pace I was going on pure adrenaline otherwise. Ten minutes must have passed with this thing pacing me before I crested a slight rise and could see the light of my house just through the trees. If I took the normal path, I'd intersect with this thing. With no other option, I veered left, swept down a hill, rounded it at the base, and burst out of the woods into a large field next to the side of my house. I began to scream for help, but there was no way anyone could hear me. I stopped, cycled the bolt of the rifle one last time, turned, and fired again into the woods. All I can say is that little rifle felt like the one thing that could protect me, although I'm sure it wouldn't have done any good against it. I paused and listened after I fired. I heard nothing. The woods were silent and still. My heart was thumping hard, and sweat mixed with blood streamed down my face. For some reason, though, I sensed it was in the woods still, and watching me, I could feel it. Not wanting to wait around, I turned and ran into the house. I broke down the second I closed the door behind me. My mom found me and saw my face was cut up and covered in blood, as were my hands. I was a total mess. Tears streamed down my face, and I kept blathering on about seeing a monster. She consoled me and cleaned up my cut. She said that it was probably just a bear. I told her that it wasn't, although I'd never seen a bear in real life at this time. She then told me a story about a time something came to her house when she was growing up. Her childhood home was literally several hundred yards away and tore down a huge branch and caused a lot of damage. She was told back then by my grandfather that it was a bear too, although I now have my suspicion. My older brother overheard what I was saying to my mom. He went to the gun cabinet, grabbed a shotgun, and went out to see if he could find the thing. I encouraged him not to, and my mom forbade it, but he went out anyway. I couldn't just let him go, so I followed after reloading my rifle's magazine. It was now pitch black out. We crossed the field to the edge of the woods. He hollered out some obscenities and fired the shotgun into the woods. I can only say now that this was his way of protecting and standing up for his little brother. We didn't hear a twig break and after a few minutes of standing there, we went back inside. That night, I couldn't stop talking about it. My father was out of town, and I couldn't wait to tell him. That night, I found it hard to sleep, even though I was exhausted, not just from the run, but from the intense adrenaline dump I had. My dad came home, and I told him. He laughed it off, and, like my mom, said it was probably a black bear. My sister and oldest brother also thought it was a bear, too. I then began to wonder if I had mistaken the identity of this thing and stopped bringing it up 
as some in my family began to ridicule me. The one person who never doubted me was my grandmother. She'd lived on the farm for 50 years and proceeded to tell me stories about odd things she'd seen, shadows in the woods and light. She questioned whether it really was a bear that had broken off the huge branch near their house years before. It felt good to have someone I trusted believe me, even though I did have someone like her who didn't think I was crazy I kept my story to myself, unless I was around company I thought I could share it with. I have to admit that my pragmatic self has wondered if I did see a bear and mistook it, but then I'll quickly push that aside, as I can still see that thing exiting the laurel and looking up at me as if it had a human shape. Even though it was at a distance, I don't recall ever seeing a snout. What I saw wasn't huge wasn't the typical looking Bigfoot, but as I drift back to that day, my memory wants to say it looked chimp-like. It took me years to finally go back into the woods, but I never ventured into them without a firearm. I know some of you are saying that any type of rifle or pistol wouldn't have an effect, and that may be true, but that's also theoretical. I'll just say that I'd rather have something than nothing call it peace of mind. I'll never know for sure, nor will I ever be able to prove what I saw to anyone. I can only share with you that deep in the southern Pennsylvania woods lurks something that, if provoked, will chase after you and leave an indelible imprint on your life. On to the next story. It was early in October of 1984 when my hunting partner, Murray, and I entered one of our favorite areas, being the Cascade Mountains in the Wilderness Lakes region of Washington State. This is an area that is comprised of wilderness in the truest sense of the word. The advent of the quad has made life exponentially easier for big game hunters around the globe. It is generally our habit to take our quads in as close as we can into the areas in which we hunt, followed by setting up camp. Once we have established our base point, from there we can either hike or quad based on the lay of the land, and what exactly we are aiming for as far as the hunt goes. Having made our way well into the forest, we linked up with a fire trail and followed it several miles further into the woods. When we came upon a suitable area for our encampment, we set up the tent just inside of the trees, under some large pines. I should also mention that both Murray and I had rifle scabbards lashed to our quads. They are the old, western design that is typically seen strapped to the saddle of a horse. These scabbards are clothed on both ends, with a buckled cover on the stock end of each scabbard. We have found through the years that this is the best way to travel with your rifle, while keeping it protected from the elements in the mountains and woods. I would ask you to keep in mind as I proceed that at this point in time, all the Bigfoot shows that are seen today were not available, and most of the so-called information that is currently available via the internet and everything else was not out there either. Having arrived at this location early in the day, We took our packs and began to hike, scouting out the surrounding area. If my recollection is correct, it was just after we had stopped for a little lunch break when we began to hike into this valley and ran across what is commonly known today as a tree structure. In our combined days of hunting, both together and alone, neither of us ever set eyes on such a thing before. It was, in our opinion, a deliberately formed stacking of dead trees, one against the other, which formed a narrow, teepee-like structure. The other thing that both of us took note of was that the species of trees used to make this structure were not directly related to what was available in this location. Yes, They were in the surrounding woods, but the quantity and type of trees that comprised this structure did not and could not have come from the immediate area. In other words, these 30 or 40 trees did not accidentally fall against each other, 
in some type of random or natural way. They had been placed here, with the question being, by whom or by what? As the day wore on, we had made our way back to camp, placing both our rifles into the scabbards on the quad. They were both parked less than 10 feet from our tent, and eventually we went to sleep. And stoked a fire to prepare some grub, Murray had said that we should sight our scope in before hunting the woods for this day. He walked over to pull his rifle out of the scabbard and said, Hey, my rifle's gone. I immediately went to look at what he was talking about. The latched end of his scabbard had been opened, with the rifle having been removed. Neither of us knew quite what to say or do, so the two of us kind of stood there, dumbfounded by this missing rifle. There was no question that it had been taken. We both knew that we hadn't left it in the woods the day before, which would have been preposterous to say the least. No hunter walks into the woods with his gun and walks out without it. It just doesn't happen. During the entire previous day, we hadn't seen anyone or heard anything. And if someone had snuck up on us during the night, they had done a damn good job doing so. Speaking for myself, I would wake up if I heard a leaf crunch. That's how lightly I sleep. I had heard nothing during the night. Murray, still having his handgun, and I, both with my rifle and handgun, decided to reconnoiter the surrounding woods in the hope of finding out who had taken his rifle. We had been gone for several hours, walking in somewhat of a gradual winding circular pattern surrounding the area in which we had set up camp. I had seen not so much as a trace of another human being having been in the area. It was about 11.30 in the morning, and it had started to rain about an hour earlier. The rain picked up quite heavily as we hiked, so we decided to head back to the camp. On our return hike, we also discussed leaving the woods since we were down one rifle and were not too comfortable with the thought that some unknown entity was in the woods with us. We arrived back at the camp and decided to wait until the rain let up a little, at which point we would break down the camp and split. I should also mention that upon entering the camp, both of us had walked directly into the tent, not having looked around whatsoever. It was about 40 minutes later, as the rain had diminished, that both of us stepped outside. We began to disassemble the tent and break down our little camp. Murray was lashing down some equipment to the back of his quad when suddenly he said, Holy man, my gun is back! I couldn't believe what I had heard, and yet there it was, sticking out of the end of his scabbard. As Murray was pulling it out of its sheath, he said, Look at these damn footprints over here. As I was looking at the prints, Murray had pulled his gun out of the scabbard and was looking at it when he then said, Someone shoved a piece of wood into the end of the barrel. It's jammed in there so hard I can't get it out. The two of us were trying to get this wood out of the barrel while at the same time checking out the footprints. It was Murray who first said that it was a Bigfoot's footprint that we were looking at and that this Bigfoot had not only taken but returned his rifle with a branch shoved into the barrel for good measure. There was no way of removing this wood from the barrel, which appeared to be virtually hammered into the end. The prints were huge, being some 24 inches in length and very wide. If it wasn't for the rainfall, we wouldn't have known this monster had been there, for we hadn't seen anything when it had apparently taken the gun in the first place. This creature obviously had the ability to plan out an executed scheme to both take and return Murray's rifle, with the business end being rendered useless. This also made it plain to us, at least by the evidence, that the Bigfoot knew what the gun did. As we left the camp, we couldn't help thinking that this beast was watching our every move. Having traveled only maybe a thousand yards up the hill, we were confronted with a tree across the trail that wasn't there when we had come in. It was a large tree that was nearly dead, and as we got up the quads, trying to figure out our next move, we both realized that this tree could not have fallen in a more perfect location 
to block our exit. The woods on both ends of the tree were so tightly packed that we could see virtually no way of getting around it on either side with our quad. We had to backtrack and enter the trees at a more favorable location where we could make our way back to the trail beyond where the tree had been felled so we could exit the woods. Later that day, as you would imagine, we had no small discussion about what had befell us over the past 24 hours. Neither of us had ever entered that area of the state again, and with good reason. On to the next story. It was early in 2018, February to be exact, that my longtime hunting buddy and I took a trip to do a little hog hunting at a ranch located near Albany and Sweetwater in southern Texas. The ranch is set up for eight people per shot to be taken out and set in place in various pre-positioned blinds at 6 a.m. All of the shooters are instructed during a pre-hunt meeting to stay in place until they are picked up at 10 a.m. by those managing the ranch. This ranch is predominantly covered in juniper, mesquite, and what I will describe as a type of bunch grass which is similar in appearance to pampas grass, growing in clusters some four to six feet in diameter. There is a ridge that forms the southernmost boundary of the ranch, upon which sits a wind turbine farm, having several smaller canyons that run due south of it. This juniper, mesquite, and grassy cover is fairly dense and consistent throughout the ranch, with its height being, say, between 10 and 15 feet. There are openings within the cover, but my belief is that a man, or anything else for that matter, could easily move about in here for miles and never be seen. This setup is such that feeders are set in place that the hogs will come to and eat. They come in groups known as sounders. After having their fill of the feeder's contents, they disperse to eat the remnants which are scattered around the feeder. It is at this time when they are separated from each other that a clean shot can be taken at an individual hog without fear of hitting another in the process. My description of this behavior at the feeder will come into play later in this story, but as for this day, my partner and I had both bagged our hogs and had been picked up. Having enjoyed ourselves to the utmost, being well treated by the staff and the hunt itself, I booked a second trip for later in the year, just after Christmas, which I planned to take with my grandson, who is 14 years old. Later in the same year, being 2018, my grandson and I had arrived at the ranch and, after attending the pre-hunt safety meeting, the two of us were brought out to our blind location near the base of the wind farm's ridge. The blind was made from a wall of brush in the front with two shorter walls on the right-hand side and the rear, leaving the left side open for accessing and exiting the blind. Positioned within the front wall of the blind was a rectangular window cut out through which you have excellent visibility of the feeder area. Using a rest, one can get off a good shot without having to duck down so much. On this particular day, I believe there were more than likely four different sounders in the area. As the first sounder came into view, it was comprised mainly of smaller-sized pigs, and to be honest with you, they seemed a bit antsy, a behavior which is generally exhibited when a predator, such as a bobcat or a coyote, is in the area. After a short while, this sounder had wandered off. Moments later, my grandson and I began to hear what sounded like two people talking, coming down the access road, but... What they were saying was unintelligible to our ears. Now the ranch has very strict rules about staying put in your blind until you are picked up for safety reasons. And I couldn't understand why there would be anybody wandering around in the area knowing the rules. Neither of us understanding a word of what was being said, I told my grandson to stay put in the blind 
as I grabbed my 45 caliber Henry and stepped out to the side of the road. Seeing no one, I realized that everything around me had suddenly become deathly silent. It left me feeling as though something or someone was going to come bursting out of the bushes at any moment, which thankfully didn't happen. It was about five or so minutes later that I could hear the birds in the woods behind me once again, that everything seemed to normalize, that everything seemed to normalize as it had been before hearing this gibberish. About an hour later, we were picked up, having scored nothing for the morning. Later that afternoon, in what was part two of the day's hunt, we were brought back to the very same blind. It was cold, with the temperature being in the 20s, as the two of us entered the blind for round number two. It was only a short while after we had come into the blind that the first sounder of hogs came into view. They seemed quite a bit jumpier than those we had seen in the morning, and they had wandered off without us being able to get off a clean shot. It was now about an hour before darkness when yet another sounder of promising hogs came into view. They were shoving and snapping at each other, as hogs tend to do when they are feeding, when suddenly from behind them I heard what I can only describe as a grunt, squeal, and cough all rolled into one. It was a very strange and most unusual sound, the likes of which I had never heard before. As soon as this sound had occurred, every pig in the sounder scattered, running in every direction into the surrounding brush. I told my grandson that this must have been a big old boar or sow, which these pigs wanted nothing to do with, and so they ran off. After this event, no more hogs had entered the area, and we were picked up. The following morning, my grandson, for whatever reason, had decided to spend the morning session in the ranch house, leaving me to go to the blind alone. There were two different sounders, which came through rather quickly, but it was before there was any good light with which to see them. A short time later, a third sounder had come through, and I noticed they were very skittish as well. Before they had a chance to move on, a nice 100-pound pig got clear of the group, and I decided to take it. My first shot with a direct was directed right at the head, which is what the ranch recommends to do of all the hunters. The hog dropped in its tracks as the rest of the sounder scattered. Suddenly, it stood to its feet, and I said to myself, Holy cow, I missed it. I followed up immediately with a second salvo, and having jerked the trigger nervously, I missed the hog entirely. Now, the ranch has a strict three-shell rule, which means you can only take three shells with you into the field on any given hunt, and... I had already spent two of my three. I knew I had but one chance left to get this right. I breathed deeply as the hog was quartering away from me, and I fired a shot right through the heart. I watched as the shot hit exactly where I had aimed, and the pig was down for the count. Since we were planning on returning to this spot that evening, I decided to let the pig lay where it was until I was picked up because I didn't want to spread any additional human scent in the area. A dead pig doesn't seem to bother the others, whereas a human scent will. That was my reasoning behind letting it be. As I sat, waiting, and watching, about 30 minutes had passed, after which yet another sounder of pigs came in to feed. Their sizes were comparable to that of a German shepherd-type dog, a couple of them started rooting my pig, and it had no reaction whatsoever, which was proof enough that it was, in fact, dead. As they browsed around for a period of about ten minutes or so, suddenly I heard that sound again which I had mentioned earlier. Every pig in the sounder came barreling at the blind, with me sitting in it with no ammo left. I sat against the opening with my legs blocking it, so that none of them could run inside as they ran full bore along both sides of the blind into the wood. There were about 30 hogs in the sounder. 
and they were gone in a matter of seconds. I sat, thinking to myself, wow, that was nuts. The commotion having ceased, I turned my head to look back out the blind's window, and my dead pig was gone. Immediately, I went outside to look for it. A short while later, the truck came to get me with two other hunters in it, and they began to assist me in the search. The three of us were very experienced in the tracking down and retrieval of game. We formed a hundred-yard perimeter around the feeder, scouring the area for the missing pig. It was about sixty yards or so from the feeder, where I came upon numerous bones from a variety of pigs, including six skulls. The first thing that I took note of was that none of these skulls were damaged, which was very odd in that the ranch recommends headshots as being the preferred method of taking a hog. None of these had a single bullet hole in them. One of the skulls was the size of a house cat, while another was the size of a large mature boar, and they were thrown around as though the bones were being thrown away as they were eaten. No hunter would have taken a pig the size of a house cat. We found no tracks other than those of the pigs, but I did notice on some of the clumps of grass impressions which had been made which were fairly long and wide. My first inclination was that of them being pig bed, but I then changed my mind about that, thinking that it was as though something had been stepping from clump to clump. Between the three of us, we hadn't found the pig, so we returned to the feeder site. Based on the amount of blood, there had definitely been a kill shot, and yet there was absolutely no sign of drag marks or blood trails whatsoever. When all the hunters were gathered back at the cabin, all were in agreement in saying that for whatever reason, the hogs weren't fanning out as they usually do, which gave way to the notion, at least in my own mind, they may had a good reason to not do so anymore. I know that something took that pig, and whatever it was, had to be able to pick it up and get away quickly. Only one critter comes to mind that has the ability to do so, as well as talk in gibberish. Bigfoot. On to the next one. Apache. Mostly, but not limited to, Arizona, New Mexico, and some of the surrounding areas. An old story of Bigfoot Sasquatch in Arizona goes back to a story from 1903 that was also reported in the Arizona Republican newspaper. In this account, an eyewitness made an observation to an all-white-haired Bigfoot, like being that was seen drinking the blood from two cougars it had killed. This is one of the only documented cases that I've ever heard about where a Sasquatch killed and ate another known predator. Apache lore seems to also suggest that these creatures are cannibals, described as warlike and, at times, even coming out at night to feed on the desert Apache. This is also vaguely similar to the neighboring Anasazi First Nation pictograph, which depict dick men that would reach into dwellings with long arms to steal Anasazi babies at night. The Anasazi may have had no idea that the creatures which they had depicted on stone-painted pictograph could actually be the one and the same Bigfoot or Sasquatch. This probably again points towards the super elusiveness of these creatures, which in some cases aren't even clearly made suspect, even though the long arms from Anasazi pictograph are also quite often noted in many of the more modern-day Bigfoot and Sasquatch observations made by eyewitnesses. Some old Apache stories of what seems to be a similarly described Bigfoot Sasquatch are retold in Morris Edward Opler's 1942 book titled Myths and Tales of the Apache Indian, one story titled The Birth of Child of the Water and The Slaying of the Monsters, in which there are depictions of a giant who is described as a bully from the beginning of human existence. The story describes the following. Long ago, there were monsters on Earth. One of them was a giant. This giant killed human beings. 
A footnote at the bottom of the page gives a further description as follows. A monster of great size, usually described as shaped like a man and ordinarily carrying a knife and a basket in which to put his victims. In the beginning, the giant made it very difficult for the first people because it stole a majority of their wild game meat, which they had hunted. As the story from the book mentions, giant stole all the meat. Giant was also a menace to children, as the story notes. The giant came nearly every day looking for children. Giant is easily fooled quite a few times. A way of life, as the story suggests, by a mother who is trying to raise her child by always keeping the baby hidden from the giant. Her husband, described to be the first hunter, is continually killing deer, yet he's coming home without any meat because the giant steals it from him. As the child of the couple, described to be the first child, who grows up to become a young man, get tired of the giant who steals all the meat, he boldly exclaims, you are not going to eat the meat this time. Giant boldly exclaims back, if you don't stop that, I'll eat you right here. The young man then boldly says back to the giant, you are not going to make excrement out of our meat anymore. When the giant asks the young man how he'll fight him, the boy pulls out an arrow, which he then displays to the giant. Object showing is a bluff. When the giant is then asked by the young man, where are your weapons, the story says, the giant pointed to four great pine logs and said, there are my weapons. The two then agree to have a shooting contest, allowing four shots each, in which the giant hurls a log each time. As the story notes, it looked as if the giant was helped by thunder, for every time the arrow flew, thunder was heard. Could this be yet another observation to the weather-changing ability of Bigfoot or Sasquatch, this time on behalf of the Apache? Luckily, the young man wasn't hit by a single log, and then it was his turn to shoot four arrows at the giant. Yet, as the story mentions, the giant stood ready. He had four plates of rock for coats over him. The giant is once again fooled by the young man, who then requests, that the giant stand on his hands and knees. This gives the young man a better vantage point for an angle that he can use to shoot off the giant's rock coat or stone coat. The young man shoots off a layer of the giant's rock coat with each shot until eventually there is only one rock coat left and the young man has only one shot remaining. The story then notes the young man's success in finishing off the giant the fourth shot went right into his heart. Then the giant began to fall. He went over four small hills when he was falling, and you can see the piles of white flint there today. It seems fascinating that the Apache, Navajo, Zuni, Pueblo, and Anasazi all have stories with suggestions of how their tribal members may have been bullied, hunted, killed, and even eaten by what seems to be similarly described as Bigfoot and Sasquatch. One might also find it interesting that these separate tribes all existed in some of the same areas and at separate intervals in some cases. As was the case of the Fremont, followed by the Anasazi, who had also disappeared before some of the above-mentioned tribes came about in much of the same area. This adds even more credibility to these stories, pictographs and legends of these various tribes of the desert southwestern Native American tribes were also feeding vast surplus populations like the Anasazi and the Pueblo who also lived in cities of stone houses and probably weren't leaving enough resources to feed on for a giant like Sasquatch especially in desert surroundings where resources might already be scarce like that of Arizona and New Mexico. It should also be known that the Apache moved seasonally with the antelope, elk, deer, and buffalo, which they would also hunt. Bigfoot in Native American stories, as well as more modern-day observation, also hunt these prey animals for food. What might occur if Bigfoot or Sasquatch couldn't acquire enough meat due to hunters, 
who may have been doing a lot of surplus killing. Might it be a similar pattern to chimps eating monkeys over food sources, which might already be scarce? In another story called Stories of the Giant, two women play dead and escape the giant. The giant used to kill people. There were two women hunting for wild berries. The giant came along. They saw that they couldn't get away, but they knew that he wouldn't eat anything dead that he had not killed himself. So they took off their clothes and played dead. Giant came along and saw them. He took a stick and poked at them. He played for a while, then got tired and left them. When he was gone, they got up and ran away. It's quite interesting how the giant had been poking at the women with a stick while they were playing dead. This seems to be a similar shared characteristic to some of the curious nature of other primates, most notably the gorilla, which sometimes uses a stick to touch another object. In another story, the conquest for daylight makes the observation of birds, which are, as we all know, only out during the daytime. In the story, they are playing a game against all of the other animals for daylight hours instead of an endless nighttime as the animals would have it. The story also notes, in those days, there was a great monster, a giant, giant on the animal side. It's interesting how in this Apache story, the giant is somehow closely associated with all of the other animals, where in European folklore, giants are usually depicted as more closely associated with humans. As the game is being played all throughout the night until daybreak, a wren then sings, Daybreak is coming. This greatly upset the giant, as the story then notes. This made the giant so angry that he took a stick from the fire and pushed it right into the wren. Keep still, there isn't going to be any daylight, he said as he jabbed the bird. That is why wren has a black mark on his head now. This seems to be a rather strong suggestion of the giant being described as both nocturnal and aggressive. As the sun continues to rise, almost all of the other nocturnal animals leave, and the giant begins to leave as he exclaims, I'm too heavy, I can't walk very fast, I'm going to leave now. The bird then begin to pursue the other animals which had lost the game that was played, including the giant. They attack the giant a number of times with little or no effect at all. Then a lizard tells the bird where the giant's heart is, as he ran to the giant. There, there's his heart right under his hind foot, he said. This little lizard shot the giant right under his hind foot, and the monster fell. Could this be another indication to a soft spot being described on this creature's body? The story then mentions, this place where they played is in Arizona. They call it Mescal Mountain. It is a holy mountain. The footnote at the bottom of the page reads, the information identified this as the Mogollon Mountain. According to David Hatcher Childress in his book, Yetis, Sasquatch, and Hairy Giant, a current non-tribal name given to Sasquatch and Bigfoot in the same Mogollon Mountains region of Arizona is the Mogollon Monster. According to Childress, the Apache have also had a number of eyewitness sightings from some of their reservation areas in more recent times. Apache National Police also have a number of recent sightings reported on record. For the most part, it seems that the Apache like to keep Bigfoot and Sasquatch a secret within their tribal community. This is probably the reason that it seems so difficult in finding some of their stories on the subject matter. The Apache description of strange beings they call Gahi, these are described to be very secretive unknown people which actually live in the mountain. It is also a forbidden superstition among the Apache to even speak the name of the Gahi, much like the fears associated with what is referred to as the Lesky or Wood Goblin by those who live throughout the borderlands among the mountains in Russia. Another informant averred that it is dangerous to even tell stories of the Gahi and to decrease the hazard, ceremonial names such as mountain people are introduced into the tales in which they appear. In one story titled, The Gahi Who Fought the Mexican Soldiers tells a dramatic revelation of some warm springs Apache 
who had been walking peacefully through the plains to the foot of Chuchilla Mountain. The foot of many mountains seems to be a common theme in many of these Native American stories of strange mountain deities. The story then notes, as quoted, that the Mexican cavalry came after them. The Apache were carrying no weapons at all, as they were trying to make an escape, yet, as the story mentions, the soldiers had guns and could kill from a distance. One man who was away from the others, running toward the mountain, prayed for help from the Gahi. The Gahi came out from the mountain, many of them. They surrounded the soldiers. They opened a cave in the rocks and with their swords drove the soldiers into the cave. Then they shut the door again and not one of the soldiers ever got out. They say there are shoes piled up at the mouth of the cave yet to show where the soldiers were driven in. A detail in a footnote at the bottom of the page reads the following, that the Gahi are notified of the plight of the Apache by wind, who acts as the messenger for them. On to the next story. To this day, I can't say for certain exactly what it was, but I know it had bitter, evil intentions. I've been born and raised close to a round Ann Harbor in Michigan. My entire life, I have never encountered anything weird or out of the ordinary. I am an avid hiker and outdoorsman and have seen it all when it comes to wildlife. I know much of my teenage years and early 20s was riddled with tales of the supposed dogman that lives out in the wilderness. But I had never encountered such a thing, or at least I thought, until more recently. This happened to me a month ago. I'm still having a hard time processing what happened. I usually like to hike and traverse through miles and miles of wilderness. As I'm hiking through the woods, I just have this odd feeling that I'm being watched, and it's making me more and more uncomfortable as I go on. I continuously look around and check my surroundings, but I don't see anything. After a short amount of time, maybe not even a half hour later, the woods start to go silent. Now, for those of you who aren't outdoorsmen, this usually happens when there is an alpha predator in the area. The only thing I can think of would be a black bear, which is the only kind of bear there is in Michigan. But I seriously doubt a black bear would be stalking me like this. I've also dealt with black bear in the past. I've never had an experience anywhere close to what I was having with any black bear. I continued to track on back to my truck, having only gone about three miles into the wood. And that's when I start to smell a sickly sweet smell. It smells like death, rotting meat, and wet dog and it was strong. At this point, I start picking up the pace and jogging back to my truck. I knew whatever I was smelling couldn't be too far away, and as soon as I started jogging, I could hear this thing start keeping up pace with me. It couldn't have been more than 20 yards behind me. I pretty much refused to turn around and look. And I literally kept my pace all the way until I made it to the tree line and ran to my truck and got the hell out of there. What's weird and also scares me at that same time is that whenever this was, I'm sure it could have easily gotten me and taken me out, but it didn't. It just kept pace with me, like it was trying to shoo me off its territory. It's really going to affect everything now 
from the way I hike to where I hike. I guess there are just some things in the wilderness we were never meant to discover. On to the next story. The story I'm about to tell happened when I was 15 years old. It was shocking and so terrifying that it changed my life forever, and the memory of it still lives in me as if it happened just yesterday. It was the third week of August, 1985. School would be starting soon, and I was training for a 10K race that was held every year for a festival in town. I remember it was a hot August day with the temperatures pushing close to 100 degrees. I was supposed to run five miles, but due to the high temperatures, I put off my run until evening. Running at night wasn't a big deal to me. I grew up on a farm in the country and wasn't scared of the dark. Often during my childhood, I ran around at night, racing through cornfields, playing hide and seek, you name it. I was outside no matter the hour. So the concept of going for a long run down a country road in the dark wasn't something I was fearful of. I had my route planned. I'd leave my house, run down the ditch of State Route 4 for about 300 yards until I reached Temple Road, which dead-ended into it. From there, I'd run down Temple Road until it intersected with State Route 98. This was the halfway mark, so from there, the plan was to turn around and just come back. Night came, and it was around 10 o'clock, and I headed out. There was enough moonlight to see, but it definitely wasn't a full moon. I got to the halfway mark at State Route 98, turned around, and started heading back. There wasn't much along Temple Road, just cornfields on one side and soybeans on the other, with small pockets of trees dotting the landscape and only a couple of farmhouses along the stretch of the road back then. I was more than halfway done my run, and it was going great. I was closing in on a crossroad, which meant I was only about a mile out from Route 4. On my left, there was a pocket of trees, then the crossroads, which was Flickinger Road, and on the other side of that, a cornfield that stretched a mile all the way to Route 4. On my right, just after the crossroad, was a field of soybeans, which too stretched out a mile. It was at the wooded area where I sensed something was wrong. I don't know how to say it but I just felt like something was off. It was enough of a feeling that I stopped running. The warm evening air felt a bit cool against my hot skin, and as I stood, taking in deep breaths and looking around, I couldn't shake the feeling that I wasn't alone. Movement suddenly came from the cornfield near the crossroad, I snapped my head in the direction of the sound and looked, but with the corn standing about six feet tall, I couldn't see anyone or anything. More sounds of movement came. This time, I saw the corn moving, and I could tell by how many stalks were being disturbed that whatever it was, it was big. This instantly jolted me with fear but only because I wasn't expecting to hear something while on my run. My first instinct was to assume it was a deer. And why? Because we had a huge deer population in Ohio, and I couldn't imagine it was anything else. I pushed aside my initial fear and began to run again. Whatever was in the corn also began to run. What was odd was whatever was there 
was not running towards me, but was running with me, like through the corn and keeping pace with me. When I say pace, I mean it was running at my exact pace. I looked over at the corn and saw that whatever was running alongside me was about four rows in from the edge of the field, making it impossible to see what it could be. I stopped again, turned, and looked, hoping to catch a glimpse but only grew more fearful as it too stopped the very second I did. I strained to see what it could be, but it wasn't moving an inch and was very quiet. I knew then this wasn't the usual behavior for a deer. The air around me was still, not a breeze of any kind, but the feeling, oh, the feeling was thick with a sense of dread. In the back of my mind, I knew deer didn't act like this, but I assumed it had to be a deer, although a very odd one, because what else could it be? Hoping to spook it, I hollered out, but nothing happened. Unsure what else to do, I took off running again, and sure enough, it ran too. Freaked that it was again pacing me, I stopped, and it stopped. I was beyond concerned. I was terrified. My adrenaline was pumping, and my mind was spinning about what it could be. By the amount of corn I saw moving when it was pacing me, it had to be bigger than a dog or coyote. And I knew there weren't bears in this part of Ohio. As I went through a list of animals large enough to make such a disturbance in the corn, only to come up with nothing, I began to tremble. My heart pounded, and the intense dread I felt was enough to make anyone go crazy. I was alone, engulfed by the dark of night, and something large was in the corn. I didn't know what it was or what was going on, but I did know that I wanted to get as far away from it as I could. I knew that I had three quarters of a mile to go until I got to Route 4, and then a short few hundred yards to my house beyond that. I didn't know what else to do except keep running. But if I did, whatever it was would only keep pacing me. This meant I needed to change it up. I needed to not just run. I needed to run as fast as I could. I had to give it all I had. I was confident in my abilities as I was a good runner and really fast. As I inhaled several deep breaths, I concocted a plan to sprint about three to four hundred yards, enough, I thought, to outpace and eventually put some distance between me and whatever the hell was in the corn still being eerily still and quiet. I figured there was no way this thing could see me because I couldn't see it, and with the fully grown corn being an obstacle, it would have a difficult time keeping up, or so I thought. I began a countdown in my head. As I ticked down, I readied myself for what felt at that moment like the run of my life. I bent slightly at the hip, leaned in, and tensed my body. Ready. Set. Go. I took off like I was being shot from a cannon. For a split second, I felt like I'd be able to outrun this thing. But then I heard it. Like the two other times, it was pacing me. Whatever this damn thing was, it was keeping up with me even though it had to blast through the corn to do so. I dug deeper and pushed harder. My pace increased 
but it wasn't any good, as it kept matching mine. If I went faster, it went faster. I could feel my heart pumping hard and fast. I was giving all I had, but it wasn't enough. I covered about 300 yards, and I could feel I was done, gassed, out of steam. Unable to keep going, I stopped, and like before, it stopped too. Now, I came to the horrifying conclusion that whatever was in the corn was not only faster than me, but there was no way it was a person. There was then, and still is now, no one who could run through the corn like it had. I don't care if you brought in an Olympic track star, they'd not be able to do it. It was impossible. I stood in the road, a deep feeling of defeat washed over my trembling body. I had totally spent all my energy to get away from this thing, and I'd failed. I took my eyes off the corn and stared down the long stretch of road that I still needed to cover. I was scared, alone, and still had a good half mile to go in order to reach Route 4. The only thing close to me was an old abandoned farmhouse about a hundred yards down the road to my right. I recalled there had been an old tree in the front yard and quickly adjusted my plan. What I'd do now was carefully make my way there, climb it to the top, and wait until morning. Armed with this new plan, I made my way slowly toward the tree. With every step I took, this thing moved too. I made it to the tree, and the second I looked at it, my heart sank. As there was nothing to grab a hold of, as the tree had been dehorned, I couldn't climb the tree. It was impossible, and once more, I felt defeated. As I stood, staring at the tree, a terrifying realization came to me. Even if I made it the next half mile to Route 4, I'd have to turn left and possibly cross paths with whatever was there. I imagined making the turn and it, whatever it was, would come out and get me. I immediately pushed the fear out of my mind and focused on what I'd do next. I wasn't done yet. I wasn't going to just give up. I needed to keep going. But with going left not an option, I decided I needed to go right. And that's when it hit me. My good friend lived off Route 4, but in the opposite direction, which meant all I needed to do was make it to Route 4, turn right, and race down about 150 yards. I thought about making a run for his house across the soybeans, but quickly dismissed the idea, as I feared I'd get tangled up in the soybean plants. No, I needed to keep pressing forward down Temple Road, but this time I'd go slow to conserve my energy for what I hope would be my grand finale, a 150-yard sprint to my buddy's house. Not wasting another second in thought, I pivoted and began my long march toward the intersection of Route 4. Each step I took was matched by the thing in the corn. In my mind, a flurry of questions were flying around. Is this thing baiting me? Is it stalking me? Is it just messing with me? I didn't know what to think. All I knew was it still hadn't come out. But that fact didn't give me peace of mind because at any moment it could. And there was not a doubt in my mind that if it did, I'd be dead. Route 4 came into view as a car barreled down it. The headlights illuminated the area for a brief moment. I readied myself for what I knew would be the run of my life, literally. More questions entered my already troubled mind. Would I look over my shoulder and see it? Did I want to look over my shoulder? Would it give chase? What was it? If I looked back, would doing so slow me down, or 
would looking back and seeing something awful scare me to the point that I'd freeze? In a snap decision, I decided that when I took off, I wouldn't look back. I'd just hammer out the run and hope that it didn't come after me. With less than 20 feet to go to the intersection, I picked up my pace and of course it matched me. I looked to my right over the rows of soybeans and didn't see any traffic. I craned my head to the left and saw a glow of lights shining over the tops of the corn. A car was coming and it posed me with another issue. Do I stop and wait or do I just make my move? I threw all caution to the wind and took off at full speed like I was coming out of the starting blocks for a hundred meter dash. I cleared where the corn ended on my left, which allowed me to see Route 4 clearly. Down the road, I spied a truck, but it was far away enough for me to safely cross. I had sworn that I wouldn't look back, but I couldn't resist. I craned my head over my shoulder. And right at that moment, I saw something exit the corn and stop. I can't recall how long I looked at it, but it was long enough to get a good look. And all I can say is the first thing that came to mind was the Egyptian god Anubis. I had no other frame of reference back then, nor was I aware of dogmen, much less Bigfoot. All I knew was it walked out upright on two legs and stood about six to seven feet tall. I could judge its height because its head was taller than the corn. It had a well-defined canine head, dark hair, and its build was similar to that of a greyhound, lean and muscular. It stood with its body postured like it was in a stance and its shoulders rolled forward. At the time, it reminded me how a linebacker stands ready for the ball to be snapped. It turned its head and looked at me. By its stance and long arms positioned out in front of it, I presumed it was readying itself to pursue me. I faced forward and gave it all I had. I cleared a hundred yards with ease, cut across one yard and came up on the boundary of my buddy's backyard in front of me and came up on the boundary of my buddy's backyard. In front of me was a chain link fence and I prayed the gate was open, but as I drew closer, I saw it was closed and most likely locked. I decided in an instant I would jump the fence. Now, the fence wasn't too tall, but it was tall enough for me not to be able to hurdle it. I reached it, grabbed hold of the top, which was just exposed and jagged metal, and threw myself over. As I flew over, a sharp edge of the fence gouged my side, but I didn't let it slow me down. I landed on the other side and could now see the swimming pool in front of me. I made a split-second decision and dove in, not thinking it was the shallow end. My chest hit the bottom and I slid down to the deep end, which was about 10 feet. I rolled onto my back, exhaled all my air, pinched my nose, and looked up. I lay there, my body screaming with pain as my eyes darted around, looking for it to walk up and stare down on me in the pool. What must have been 30 seconds went by. Nothing showed up. No towering figure, no shadows cast down on me in the pool. Had I made it? Did it not follow me? Unable to hold my breath any longer, I swam to the surface, quickly looked around, but didn't see it anywhere. I swam to the edge and crawled out. Frantic, I raced to the back sliding door of the house, I didn't know if it was locked or not. I grabbed the handle and pulled. The door flew open. I stepped through the vertical blinds that had been closed for privacy and into the house. What I didn't know was his parents were out of town and what he wasn't expecting was anyone to suddenly appear. Yet here I was. 
My buddy jumped from his chair when I entered the living room. He wasn't just shocked to see me. He was also a bit embarrassed, as he'd been watching the Playboy channel. He peppered me with many questions, all of which I answered as best I could between heavy breaths. I finally regained my composure and told him what had happened and what I'd seen. At first, he doubted me, assuming I'd seen something like a deer. I wouldn't waver. I knew what I'd seen. I knew what had just happened. Eventually, he came around, and when he did, he too became scared. After agreeing for me to stay the night, we locked all the doors and turned the lights out. The rest of the evening was spent walking around his house and peering out of the windows, half expecting to see the dogman lurking about outside. The morning came and brought a sense of calm and relief. I had survived whatever that was I had seen, and I couldn't be happier. My buddy took me home, and I immediately told my father what had occurred. I didn't know what to expect from him, but he quickly dismissed my story. He told me that because I had gotten spooked that my mind had played tricks on me, like I did with my buddy. I stood my ground and told him I knew what I had seen and that I hadn't imagined it. What's interesting, though, about my dad was that after my encounter, he never went outside at night without tucking a thirty-eight caliber pistol into the back of his pants. That told me all I needed to know. He did believe me, but by admitting it, he probably thought it would have scared me more than I already was. I chalked up his dismissal as a way of him protecting me. Much time has separated me from that night, but the fear that still remains in many ways. I've never run that stretch of road since, even during the daytime. I've also never ran again at night anywhere. I still live in the area. And no matter when I venture out at night, I usually have a weapon with me, and I'm always on alert. Years later, I became aware of the term dogman, and upon doing some research, I have no doubt that what I encountered that night was just that. I'm not afraid to tell anyone about what happened to me that night. I know what happened. And I know what I saw. My openness and transparency has no doubt resulted in some rolling their eyes or thinking that I imagined it. But I have met others who believe. These believers have showered me with their theories of that night. Some say that a dogman has a trait of a canine, those being that they run and hunt in a pack. They pointed out that maybe the one that paced me was simply driving me to the others that were waiting. This thought has, and still, sends chills down my spine. What if I had decided to make a run for my house? Would the one that exited the corn have given chase, or were there others just on the other side of the road in the cornfield? I'll never know, but it gives me pause. I still don't know why it never came out of the corn before Route Four. Was it just toying with me? I have replayed that night over and over again, and each time I imagine it coming after me, and what follows is my demise. It was faster than me, appeared much stronger, and without a doubt could have run me down and killed me, and yet it didn't. Again, I don't know why it never came after me. I'm just happy that it didn't. To those who may doubt the existence of a dogman, I can tell you that they exist, and there is plenty of open and remote land for them to call home. Those who scoff at a story like mine, I say that history has shown us many tales of strange creatures. Only for those creatures to eventually be discovered decades later by the scientific community. For me, 
It's only a matter of when, not if, dogmen are scientifically proven to exist. But if it doesn't happen in my lifetime, that's fine. I know what I experienced that night, and I know what I saw as it seared into my memory. So, as a warning to those of you who are listening, dogmen are out there. And if you're ever thinking of running late at night on Temple Road, don't. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!